Hey traders, this is Blake Morrow with Trader Summit and I have Mr. Jim Welsh with us. He is here to celebrate and ring in the new year. Jim, how are you? I'm doing good, uh, ready for 2024. I wanna wish you, Blake, and all of our faithful uh, viewers a healthy, happy 2024. I know we're gonna do our best to also try to make it a profitable one. Absolutely. And Jim, yeah, you know, I couldn't ask for a better guide this year. Uh, you've been you've been so right at every turn of the market, um, you know, and, and of course you get we all get things wrong. But for the most part, you've had, you've had this market nailed. Um, and, uh, you know, it's interesting. We're 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 kind of going out near the highs of the year, although, you know, the last trading day of the year, we're seeing a little bit of profit taking. But uh, we've seen a lot of year, uh, end of year flows come through the market the last couple of weeks. And I, I'm excited to hear what you have in store for us going into this next year. So thank you so much yeah. for, for guiding us. Well, thank you for your kind comments. Appreciate it. You know, we try to do our best. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, again, I think the key for me is really having a firm understanding of monetary policy, uh, you know, having a pretty good idea of what the economy is doing, and then obviously using technical analysis to look at the financial markets to see when all three line up. When that happens, it's for me, it's you know, it gives me a high conviction level, uh, you know, in terms of what I expect to happen. And so to me, one of the things that I think is going to be key in the first six months of this year is obviously paying very close attention to the Fed because expectations are really, really high. In other words, Wall Street is expecting six rate cuts. Yeah, The Fed has penciled in three. So obviously that gap is going to get resolved one way or the other. In my take early in the year, and we talked about this last year, or last uh, two weeks, is I think the economy is going to continue to be okay as we go into early 2024. And you have two groups within the Fed. You have the doves who think we they should be cutting quickly and often starting in March. And then you have what I call the patient hawks. You know, they're not looking to jam rates higher or anything. They just want to wait for more data to come in so that they really do have confidence that, okay, when we do cut the funds rate, that inflation will stay down as we get into 2025 and 2026. And I think in the short run, the patient hawks include Chair Powell. And well, that's why I don't think we're going to see a, a rate cut in March. Um, and again, the markets are expecting that. So to me, that's the first little hurdle or speed bump uh, the financial markets, I think, will encounter as we get into next year. So uh, what's interesting is, is um, you know, these, these, uh, these, the first chart, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put it up here in a moment. Yeah. Um, but these these guys and gals on the on the Federal Reserve Board, they are academics, most of them. Uh, that's yes. Where they, that's where they their their background stems from. And and they all obviously are very, um, you know, um, well educated in the history of interest rates, the Fed, mm -hmm. prior decisions. And I think uh, everybody on on the Federal Reserve Board really is is still looking at you know, the, the inflation surge that we had in the 70s and 80s, and they just don't, don't want to repeat that. It, you know, it's one thing to miss that inflation's coming, which they did, but it's another one. It's another thing to make sure that inflation is contained and, and everybody, it, and this is from like the beginning of me coming into the, the markets in the 90s, I've understood this, that yeah. when inflation runs amok, it's hard to contain, you know, it's, you, you can use the uh, analogy of letting the genie out of the bottle, the, 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 the trying to put toothpaste back in the, uh, you know, tube. tube. It, the, all those analogies, you know, we are dealing with it today. And, and I think, yeah. um, I think what you're saying is these patient hawks really understand that. I think so. Because Paul has said, we got to get this right. Easing prematurely could be a mistake. And as we've discussed over the last couple of months, really looking at things like capacity utilization, which shows you how much tightness there is in the production side of the economy, is that 78.8. Well, that supports inflation. It gives companies pricing power. 
And we are, in fact, seeing companies not across every single sector, but there's still companies enjoying and implementing price increases because they can, because demand is still strong enough and people are willing to pay it. So that's one component. The other thing is wages. Uh, wages make up about 65% of the cost of goods and services. So we still have a very tight labor market. Paul again noted that on December 13th, even though everybody else seemed to ignore that. And what that implies is, uh, Blake, if the economy slows, but not enough to bring capacity utilization down and the unemployment rate up, wage growth has to slow from 5.2% through November, according to the Atlanta Fed, I think something closer to four or under four. Those are, I think, the, the views of the, the patient hawks, that that's some of the stuff they need to see so that when they do cut rates and it does stimulate growth in 2025 and beyond, that you know enough excess capacity throughout the economy was created as a buffer zone so that the, you know they cut rates, the economy starts to improve in 2025. Well, if you don't have that buffer zone, you're going to hit price restraints pretty quickly. And that's where the 1970s mistakes appear again. Well, so well, Jim, you're I, right, I, wanna, I believe. I, I want to get into these charts and, and I want to make sure that everybody sticks around towards the end because I got a couple of hard questions that I'm going to be asking you towards the oh no yes uh that, that i know you're well equipped to, to answer um you know so make sure you all stick around for that so jim without yeah. further ado let's get into your first first chart that you brought here and and you, the, the first chart is, yeah. is about the voters so uh explain yeah basically bit. given you know i think the critical nature of this coming year uh, this is a chart and by the way if people send me an email blake jim welsh macro at gmail this chart is in the uh, January macro tides, okay. and so are a couple other charts, because um, this may be hard for people to keep. But personally, this should be on right next to your your uh, uh, you know your desktop or wherever your quote screen, because it's important. Now, this is an attempt by an uh, an entity to range the members from most dovish to most hawkish. But the most important thing is 2024, who gets to vote? So there are seven board seats. Right now, there's only six people in those. So those folks, Chair Powell uh, and the other Board of Governors, they get to vote every time. The New York Fed president gets to vote every time. And then the other four seats of voting uh, voters are rotated among the other 11 Fed districts. So to me, the key thing here is being aware of, of the Fed district president, who's voting. And the idea being here is in coming weeks, we're going to hear opposing views. We're going to hear the doves talk about, hey, inflation's coming down. And as inflation comes down, the real funds rate goes up. And I first wrote about this in, in the September macro ties. So if inflation goes from four to three, and you keep the funds rate at four and th uh, three eighths. Well, that one percent drop in inflation, when you adjust the funds rate for it, it's like you you just increase the funds rate by a full percentage point. So that's the argument of the doves. Is inflation's come down a lot, which means the real funds rate has increased, and if it continues to come down, that represents a certain amount of restrictiveness and an increase in restrictiveness that they're worried about uh, because ultimately it will hurt unemployment or increase unemployment, I should say. Uh, the patient hawks are more aligned of, you know what, we want to avoid those 1970s mistakes and so forth. So the next chart shows you uh, just the table of who are the voters of the district presidents. As I said, the New York Fed always gets a vote. And so you have Bostick, Daly, Barkin, and Mester. So the point being for me is when I hear Barkin give a, a speech or his interview, <clears throat> what's he saying? Um, at a meeting, every person, every member of the FOMC gets to talk about what they think the economy is doing. The Fed presidents discuss what's happening in their districts. And then obviously they give a view in terms of what they think monetary policy should be. So everyone gets to say something. 
But the people who actually cast the vote, to me, you know, are more important to pay attention to. And I believe Powell has done a good job of crafting a consensus. The number of dissenting votes in the last four years is the second lowest in the last 70 years. So now Powell, is, it's a tougher chore because he's got these two groups, the doves who want to cut sooner and often and the patient hawks that want to wait a little while. I think he's a patient hawk based on a number of his comments that I don't think has really changed his viewpoint. Um, my take is I think he's going to be able to say, listen, the economy's still doing okay. Um, as a result, you know, we can afford to wait a little bit longer. Uh, and I think that's going to be persuasive uh, to some of the doves in terms of, okay, um, the unemployment rate's still near a 50-year low, wages are still growing, you know, so waiting a little while longer. So that's why I don't think they, they cut in March. But there's a lot of data that's going to come in between now and then. Um, you know, my take is that the economy is going to be okay. We're going to continue to see inflation come down, as I discussed in the January macro tides. The takeaway values from uh, January and February of 2023 uh, are about 90 basis points. So if you only add 50, that means the CPI and the PC are going to drop by three tenths, four tenths of a percent. But then as you go beyond February, Blake, the next five months through July, the takeaway values are quite a bit less, which means the hurdle rate's going to be harder to get the inflation rate to keep coming down. Yeah. So again, I think it's a close call. I believe Powell, at being the chair, will convince everyone that we should wait a little bit longer. And that's why I don't think they're going to be cutting in March. So, you know, how's this going to change the dot plot moving forward? Because that that that's what everybody's kind of focused on when you have a yep. shift in members. How different is it going to be? Yeah. Well, to, again, in September, the range between the high dots and the low dots was 25 basis points. <laughs> the range at the December meeting is 150. So that's why all of a sudden now you have this split within the Fed of those who think, hey, inflation's coming down, the real funds rate's going up, it's adding more restrictiveness, we need to cut. The other point that Powell will make is that the financial conditions, you know, tighten significantly from July to October. Well, obviously with the rallies in the stock market, treasury yields coming down, financial conditions have eased very significantly. In other words, they've taken away all the tightening that happened after the July. Uh, August, uh, October uh, spike. Wait, so to me, that's another thing that Powell will again? be able to talk about. I'm sorry? Uh, mortgage rates back at zero again? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. No. You know, so things but like that. I'm glad you brought that up. Substantially. They're down 120 basis points. Yeah. So the point being is, will that spur housing activity? Yes. The affordability has improved a little bit because lower mortgage rates. But because there's so little supply, we're going to see upward pressure on housing prices, making it you know, out of reach for a, a significant percentage of first-time home buyers or people who need to move to a bigger house and so forth. So my point is the combination of the economy being okay, this big drop in uh, you know, financial conditions in terms of them easing significantly, I think gives him the level of, you know, a persuasive argument. But the, the dots tell us there are now two groups in the FOMC. And that's why I was showing, you know, who's voting, all the rest of that stuff. Because for 18 months, they all sang the same too. I mean, Goolsby was on board for 75 basis point hikes. Um, well, now he's, he's, I think, the leader. Uh, he's the guy at uh, three and seven eighths in terms of that lowest dot my guess is Goolsby. Um, you know, he's from Chicago. Um, I, you know, I, I'm not going to, a lot of people are like, oh, it's just political. You got an election and all that. It's not like they're unaware of it. But I really believe Powell and most of the other people, they're trying to do what's right. You know, if everything was copacetic, we didn't have a 40 year high in inflation over the last two years, then politics might play a bigger role. But I, you know, even then I'm not, I, I just don't like it, or I just don't appreciate when people say, oh, they're just going to keep cutting rates because they got an election coming. All right, that's the depth of your analysis, really? That's, 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 that, is, uh, that is not very deep, though. No, 
No, you know, so anyway, I think, you know, given the comments that were made after the last meeting by Mester, Barkin and Bostick, um, they were definitely in the patient hawk camp. Daly and Goolsby, they're in the camp of, you know, we really don't want to have the fund, the real funds rate keep going up as inflation comes down camp. So again, this is what's going to play out. And obviously economic data is going to play a role. We are going to see inflation drop when we get the January and February CPI and PCE numbers in February and March, you know, because it's always a month lag. Um, but again, I, I think Powell is going to persuade uh, the, the doves to, oh, let's be a little more patient, you know, give this a little bit more time. Now, the caveat is if, if the economy suddenly really starts to tank, <laughs> that would change the dynamic. Because as I said, one of his arguments is, hey, the economy is still growing above trend. So we can wait a few more months to make sure that, you know, things are going to fall into place for us to see 2% inflation in 2025. All right. Well, the, the next chart you brought is the Fed fund rate. And what? why did you bring this chart in? Well, well, because right now everybody's going, I look at the Fed funds futures are telling us the Fed's going to cut the funds rate six times. So the point here is, as I said, the Fed funds futures are almost always wrong. Not kind of wrong, but wildly wrong. So you can see from 2010 through 2015, look at all those things. You know, you see the black line, that's just a flat line. In other words, if funds rate didn't move, and you look at all the, well, we think it's going to go up two, three times. We're going to go through all this. And then finally, in December of 2015, the Fed raised the funds rate once. Oh, OK, they're going to keep going. Um, and then, you know, obviously the pandemic, we can throw that out because, you know, that's just a bogey, if you will. And so those estimates. But look at as they started to raise rates in 2022, you can see. All the time, oh no, the Fed funds is going to peak here. It's going to peak here, peak here. And, and now what we see is, oh, we're going to see this huge decline in the funds rate over the next 18 months, you know, before right. they start ticking it higher. So my only point is, hey, folks, do not rely on the funds rate futures as a guide to what the Fed may or may not do. To me, what is important is markets believe this poor data. And that's what you want to fade. That's what you want to look at. So to me, they're looking for six cuts. I don't think they're going to get it. So at some point in time, if indeed that proves true, markets are going to react negatively because, oh, no, we're not going to get the cut in March. We're not going to get the six cuts we were expected because inflation is down. And that's where we'll see market moves in the first half of next year when that message comes home. Now, again, could I be wrong? Yeah, I could be wrong. But the only reason why the Fed cuts six times next year is because the economy is a lot weaker yeah. than anybody's projecting at this point. Right. And 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 that's going to bring up a, a couple of questions towards the end. So yeah. let's uh, let's let's continue on. Yeah. Where, where does this leave with where does this leave the dollar? Because the dollar, you know, has come under pressure. Um, you know, there's a lot of people that think that the dollar could be heading towards 90. Um, are you in that camp? Uh, no, at least again, in October, late October, it was like, hey, treasury yields are coming down. The pattern in the dollar suggested we were going to see a pullback. And I felt that getting down to the 101 range or so was coming, at least under 102. Um, and there's an outside chance we'll see it below the July low. But the pattern to me looks like, OK, we're nearing the end of this decline in my view and my perspective regarding the economy is that i think it's going to be okay that the fed isn't cutting in march and if that proves accurate that's something that would give the dollar a boost so my take is blake we're getting near a trading low in the dollar index uh over the next call it a week two weeks maybe you know We'll see, you know, year end can get a little funky. Um, and I'm sure you know that better than I. 
But I do believe the setup here is for a rally in the dollar back to the 103.50 to 104 as, gee, the economy continues to chug along. And we listen to more of the patient hawks saying, you know, I think we should wait. You know, I'm not convinced inflation is completely under control and so forth. Um, and that should give the dollar a tailwind. And that's my guess. Um, when we look at, uh, well, we're going to do the gold next. I should have reordered it. But uh, so anyway, that that's the take. To me, I think we're nearing a trading low. Gold, I still am looking for a pop above 21.22. But as I've talked the last two, three weeks, there are two paths. One path is, hey, from the low at 18.12, it's nothing but a big ABC. And we're going to see gold drop below 18.12. That can't, in my view, that can't be ignored, all right? But the other pattern is, okay, we got a one, two, one, two, and this is going to really take off. Well, given the weakness in the dollar, I'm a little disappointed that gold hasn't run further with it, you know? Yeah. So in that case, the high at 21.22 is the end of the ABC. The sharp break was wave one. This bounces wave two. And then we're going to see wave three, four, five take gold below 1812. So to me, it's kind of almost imperative that it really get going here. Um, you know, it should hold above 2010, I think, um, something like that. Before I, there was a low at 1974, which was where you have that little line there. Um, I think you can raise your stop up to around 2010 at this point. Um, but anyway. My, I leaning toward a rally above 2122, but I also am trying to be realistic and acknowledge what's going on. Yeah. And uh, I mean, if you do, uh, um, you know, you, you correlate, well, one of the best correlations in the market, in my opinion, has always been gold and dollar. They can rise, they can fall together. Um, they, they will break, but uh, a lot yeah. of times they, they tend to be very opposite. So if yes. you see a pullback in gold, that would suggest that the dollar is, you know, created a, a tradable low if you will right and yeah so. yeah and, and again well we'll just see yeah. um but to me the chart pattern in gold reinforces a little bit the pattern in the dollar and then we look at treasury yields and as you know late october october 23rd i said that I, I recommended tlt thought treasury yields were going to come down they came down way more than i expected in, in the subsequent two months now, uh, TLT was about 84.50 on October 23rd. My take back then was, I think a rally to 105, 109 is coming. Uh, it's rallied to 100 very, very quickly. As we see, 10-year uh, yields are down 120 basis points. I think, again, if these pieces fall into place, that Wall Street's overly optimistic about the Fed cutting in much, March in six times, to me, yields ticking back up to way four of lesser degree, which is around four and a quarter, 430, seems pretty normal, you know? And, and so that's my expectation is that the surprise is going to be maybe early next year in the first quarter is that we're going to see treasury yields tick up. That obviously provides the backdrop for the dollar strengthening. We'll see how gold handles that. Um, and, you know, to me, obviously, Treasury yields ticking up would be a headwind for the S&P. All right. Well, the, the last chart you you brought is uh, is the S&P. So let's talk about the possible yeah. headwind here because we're right at near all time highs. Yeah, we are. Um, and I'm just looking at the pattern. I think there's the potential, Blake, that there's a group of people, institutional money managers, that might want to lower their exposure to the magnificent seven stocks, the mega cap stocks, you know, and investors early next year. And and they're not turning negative. I mean, the main thing, you know, my point has been the last two weeks, there's no reason to sell. And when there's no reason to sell, it doesn't take a lot of buying pressure to lift the market. And we've just seen this grind higher over the last really two, three weeks. I think there's the potential for a very sharp, quick break below the recent low, which I think was 46.97 on the S&P. 
But I think the market is the mentality of the market in terms of the no recession, Fed's cutting rates, they're going to buy that first dip. And my take is that this is an ABC down to under 4,700. They're going to buy that dip and we're going to see a push above 48.18. Um, if things get crazy, you know, there's an outside chance of 52.14. You know, it can't be ruled out. 52.14, but it, that's, a, that's a hell of a target and a lot of people are bullish right now. They are. And there's, re you know, that uh, the contrarian in me says, OK, it's time to get kind of take the other point of view. But the momentum is very, very strong. The market is extremely overbought. Why? Well, because the narrative is so bullish. You know, economy is OK. Earnings up 12 percent and the Fed's going to be cutting the funds rate six times. You can't get much more positive in terms of a narrative than that. So low selling pressure. You want in, you get a dip. Uh, I think that first dip gets bought. And then we'll just see how aggressively, um, you know, the buying comes in. You know, some of the people that might sell the mega Magnificent Seven, they're likely to turn around and take those monies and buy cyclical stocks. Again, if you don't think a recession is coming, the cyclical stocks have had a nice rally since October, but for the last two years, they've really underperformed. So that's why I, I just think that the momentum is so strong that there's going to be a buy the dip mentality uh, on the first decent decline. So um, if I'm right, you know, we get that dip, we get a rally up higher. And then I think there's a, a larger decline, three to five percent sometime in the first quarter. If I'm right about the dollar strengthening, treasury yields ticking higher and so forth. Um well, Jim, now now for some of the hard questions. So, you know, you have been um, you, one of the, one of the real benefits of listening to you is is uh, knowing that you're matching like a, a the, the, the economy, not only the U.S. economy, kind of the global economy, rates, what's happening technically, matching up with a with a fundamental backdrop, if you will. Uh, which I can appreciate. That's something that as traders, that's what we try to do. We we have a technical view of where we think the market is going. And then we have to try to back it up with, you know, what's the what's the evidence. One of the things that um that you have been pretty vocal on uh is that the uh, the, the the US economy is gonna eventually slow. And mm -hmm. and and a lot of people believe that in 2023. And obviously, the, the the U.S. economy has done a lot better than it had expected. So, what are your, your views going into 2024? Are we going to have a soft landing, or do you think there's still eventually going to be a hard landing? Um, well, my expectation was that we were going to see more slowing in the fourth quarter, and in a way, you could say, well, it was five percent GDP in the third quarter, and we're at about two and a half percent in the fourth quarter. But I was looking for more slowing than that. All right. Um, I thought unemployment, continuing unemployment claims would tick up. Well, they did, but not as much as I thought. Job growth would slow, but they didn't slow as much as I thought. So what happened is that the San Francisco Fed, and I put a fair amount of emphasis on this, said that the excess savings were going to be gone at the end of September. Well, they came out a couple of weeks ago and said, uh, we, our estimate is they had $433 billion of savings in September. So that helps explain, um, you know, the, the ongoing strength. I think that strength is going to continue uh, into the first part of next year. The major question, and to your question, does it negate the uh, outlook that the, there's a, a, a meaningful slowdown coming? And for me, the answer is no. At some point in time, the excess savings get spent. Uh, at some point in time, the increase in uh, borrowing rates, the, the tightening of lending standards, slowly but inexorably starts to hammer and hit the economy. So to me, that the first part of the year, I think there's a, oh, wait, the economy is not slowing enough for the Fed to give us all these rate cuts. And then I think by mid-year, we are going to see a pronounced slowing. And as I've said, I think at least one quarter of negative GDP. So for me, right or wrong, I think the odds are we are indeed going to see a fairly, you know, decent slowdown in the economy, enough to 
raise people's concerns that, oh, wait a second, maybe we are going to have a recession. Now, and that's all it will take to generate selling in the stock market is people starting to worry about that. Um, so, you know, I, I just think the uh, the uh, slowdown has been delayed by a number of factors. Um, and, but I, I think ultimately the changing of interest rates and tightening of lending standards and so forth, that, that's important stuff. And going back the last 60 years, you know, those indicators have always signaled accurately a recession. So, so you're saying that we will have a recession next year? At least one quarter of negative GDP growth. <clears throat> And whether it's two to give the official definition, yeah. remember in the first half of 2022, we had two negative quarters, right? Everybody, oh no, we got a recession. And you know, as you know, and remember, yep. I said, no, no, we don't have a recession. Things are just fine. I didn't think there'd be a recession in the first half of this year. My expectation was we would see a slowdown in the fourth quarter, which you know marginally has taken place. Um, but the overall framework that I've been running on is that the yield curve inversion, which everybody last year and in the first part, oh my God, with the yield curve, no, it's a recession. Hey, that is a very reliable indicator. The average lead time is 19 months. And with all the excess savings, you know, it kind of implied that, all right, and, and this is why I was off a little bit. Again, I thought excess savings were going to be running down based on San Francisco Fed's estimate at the end of September. Yeah. But 19 months from July of 22, oh, wait, that's January of 24. So my point is we're really just getting to the point where the average lead time of an inversion causes a recession in January of 24. So, you know, that's an average. That means there's been instances, obviously, where it was 24 months, 25 months, whatever. So, again, I just think to assume that the, the most aggressive tightening in 40 years, the biggest increase in lending standards, in 40 years isn't going to have a material effect on the economy i don't know i'm not on i'm not in that camp yeah and and that's and and that's you know um i've, I've heard you say this many times over the especially over the last 12, uh, 12 months and um you know discuss this specific topic that's why um you know i think looking in the next year it's going to be there's going to be some uh, there's going to be some potholes around, you know, 2023, what I think was the year of the surprise, the out, yep. uh, the, the outperformance of uh, the U.S. economy. Um, but this 2024 is going to be a lot more volatility as rate expectations are shifting and they're going to probably be shifting quite a bit this year. And yep. the economy is more than likely based on your lag that you point out is likely yeah. to uh, slow down significantly. Now, what I will interject is technically the strength of the market right now is very healthy. All right. If we are going to edge toward or, you know, where the economy is going to slow meaningfully and maybe go into recession officially, um, the technical underpinnings of the market will weaken before that we get to that point. So that to me is what I'll be looking at. In other words, the advanced decline line, which has improved significantly since late October, at some point, time is going to start to flatten out. Um, you may get a divergence where you get a pullback, the S&P goes up to a higher high, and the advanced decline line hits a lower high. That's what happened in January 2022 and many other times going back the last 60 years. So to me, that's where you have to integrate the technical aspects to confirm, okay, I think the economy is going to slow. I've got good reasons to expect that. But until the, the underpinnings of the market weaken it's premature to get bearish be oh, just because of that expectation right and and that to me is where combining technical and fundamental analysis can really help avoid making big mistakes great well jim uh once again i want to say thank you for for guiding us through 2023 i can't wait till we get to meet this next year uh, on the flip side of the new year and i want to say um you know thank you for for being well, with us and you're if you, welcome if you all like what jim does make sure you give him a thumbs up email jim at uh, jim welsh uh macro at uh, gmail.com is that correct jim that is correct and i'll and, send you the and, january macro tides and let and let jim know that you heard us or you heard him here on the trader summit 
and uh, jump down in the comments yeah. below if you have any any uh, comments for Jim about going into uh, 2024. Uh, so, Jim, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Hey, you're welcome. Thank you. And uh, we'll talk to you next year. Yes, we will. We'll talk to you <laughs> next year. Indeed. Have a great one and uh, have a safe and happy New Year celebration. Back at you. Hey traders, Blake Morrow here. Thanks for stopping by our YouTube channel. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to our channel. Also click the bell notification so you do not miss any of our market-related trading analysis from some of the leading industry experts. Thanks for stopping by. We'll see you in the next video.